In this segment, we will discuss limit of functions at finite numbers. It's a mathematical concept similar to limits at infinity. Limits is a theoretical concept and underpins many, if not all, results that you will meet in calculus. What we will do, we will introduce the concept of the limit and try to explain it from different angles. We will look at applications of limits in life sciences. And in particular, limits are very, very useful to discuss mathematical models and what they predict for their application. We will also introduce one-sided limits, which is a generalization of um, the limit. And we will talk about infinite limits, which is a special case. When thinking about limit in practical terms, well, we can think of it as trying to understand the trend that the function presents. What, what will happen, we will try to evaluate value of the limit by looking at the behavior of function as we get close to a particular point. In some sense, we are trying to make judgment about the destination where we headed by synthesizing the observation on the way to the point, but not when we get there. So, it turns out that, in some sense, limits generalize the concept of value of a function at the point. So we do have value of a function. Take the function, take a point, plug the point into function, that's the value. What limit says, it says, don't look at the value, look nearby. And based on what you see, you either will or will not assign a value of the limit. And then we will know something more about the function. Let us take a look at the following problem. Suppose a ball dropped from a cliff. The ball starts to fall down and distance from the point it was released will obey the following law. It's the squared time law discovered by Galileo. The question is, what is the velocity of the ball after five seconds? And this question is loaded. So first of all, how do we even define velocity of the ball? One thing to consider is the average rate of change, or average velocity. And we can have this definition over here. Suppose S is a function that gives the position of the object moving along the coordinate axis. And we can define the average velocity as change in position over here. That's the change in position uh, over the time lapsed, which is over here. Why don't we take this function and compute the average velocity for different time intervals? And I will use the software called Desmos for this purpose. All right, so first of all, I need to set up a function. I will say s of x, and the reason I use x is for uh, convenience. I will use introduce variable t later, but to define the function, I will use a different letter. So here we go. The function is 4.9 multiplied by x squared. That's the function that we're looking at. And now we would like to create a table. And the uh, variable for the table will say t. And for the expression, we're going to code the expression for average velocity, which is a fraction s evaluated on t minus s evaluated at a particular point of interest for us, a uh, point of time where we want to compute the average velocity is five seconds. So here we go, that's our starting moment. So it's gonna be S of T minus S of five. That's the change in distance from the time moment five seconds to some time in the future or past. And um, we divide that by the time lapse, which is T minus five. Okay. 
the function is defined and it will automatically compute values of the function if we provide value of the variable t. So let us start from plugging some values of the time uh, prior to 5. So like say 4.9. Okay, we get an approximation. Now, the claim is that if we are looking for the velocity of a fallen object, that velocity will grow. The, because of the acceleration of gravity, the object will travel faster, faster, and faster. If we are interested at the velocity at a particular moment in time, it will change. We expect that it will be different for different moments in time. So when we think about average velocity, it encapsulates a period in time. And we know during that period, the object will accelerate. If we are looking for object at a particular moment in time, it comes natural to consider smaller and smaller and smaller intervals centered around uh, t equals five. So here we go. I'm going and start computing um, average velocity for the interval for 4.99 seconds to 5.0 seconds. That's a much smaller interval in time, and I have uh, the following value. But I can shrink the interval even further. I will now look at just one thousandth of a second, and I get the answer 48.9951. And if I go a little bit further, one ten thousandths of a second time lapse, then we get the answer 48.99951 for the average velocity over that tiny interval. So for all practical purposes, if we're looking at the fallen ball, then um, one thousandth of a second, that's a pretty, pretty short period of time. And um, we can think of accepting that number as a, for, for practical reasons. However, uh, if we continue this process uh, in, and consider even smaller intervals in time, we see that the number is changing, but it's changing less and less and less. It looks like the number is approaching the value of 49, and, but uh, to get to that value, we have to consider intervals that are smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, let us change gears a little bit and let us um, start evaluating that uh, the same expression, but uh, taking the moment of time uh, t in the future. So let's start with 5.1, and then we go to a uh, shorter period of time, 5.01, and then we go to the shorter period of time, 5.001, and yet shorter 5.0001, and finally I will take the 5.000. Zero one. So you can see again that the numbers are still changing, but they're changing less and less. And it looks like the average velocity also approaches 49. So we therefore conclude that if we are to continue that process and look at smaller and smaller and smaller intervals in time, that the answers should come out about 49. This approach in which we consider smaller and smaller intervals in time, in fact, is the definition of the instantaneous velocity. We will define instantaneous velocity as the number that you obtain if you continue shrinking those intervals indefinitely. And this is where we have a logical loophole because so far, we have not introduced what does it mean continue to shrink indefinitely and how we define that value. If we look at this function, we cannot substitute t equals a into that function. If we substitute t equals a, we will obtain expression 0 over 0, which is undefined. The solution is to introduce the concept of limit and talk about the limiting value of the average velocity so over a shorter, shorter period of time, allow that period of time shrink all the way to zero. We'll be talking about trends. What is the trend? Where are the values headed? 
as we shrink that interval, taking t after the t equals 5, like 5.1, 5.0001, or before 4.9, 4.9999, and we look at the trends. What kind of trends we observe? And we see that the trend is that values are approaching 49. So in this particular case, the velocity at 5 seconds, the instantaneous velocity, appears to be 49 meters per second. So in this case, limit generalized well of the function. We cannot evaluate the function, but we can look at the trend and we see as we are close to t equals 5, values of the average velocity come close to 49. With some care, we can make specific meaning. What do we mean by this trend? We introduce the concept of limit, and we can use it to define instantaneous velocity. Let us look at another motivating example to introduce the concept of limit, which is closely related to what we just discussed, but slightly different angle. So here we have two functions. The first function is a fraction x squared plus 1 divided by x minus 1. The second fraction is x squared minus 1 divided by x minus 1. So you, you notice that the difference in the expressions for functions is very small. One has plus and one has minus, but the graphs will look very, very different. So the graph on the left actually will take on infinite values um, when the variable is close to 1. Now, the graph on the right does not take on infinite values. And if you compute this graph for x not equals 1, you will see that the graph is a line. However, at some point, there are similarities between these functions. They are both undefined at x equals 1. So if you're only looking at value of the function at x equals 1, the answer will be the same for the two functions, undefined. The difference will be only seen if we look not at x equals 1, but near to x equals 1. So it turns out that the concept of limit allow us to distinguish these two behaviors. Let us now give the definition of the limit of function at a final point. Suppose function f is defined for all x near some value a, except maybe at a itself. We say that L is a limit of the function f of x as x approaches a, and you write this expression, which I will go over in a second. If values of f of x can be made arbitrarily close to L, but taking x sufficiently close to A. Now, when we take x sufficiently close to A, we'll consider mix of values to the left and to the right from A that is on both sides. Now, what we don't need to do, we don't need to look at the value of function at point A itself. That is not used in the definition. So what does the limit tell us? It says, look near x equals A and see if the values of the function approach a particular value. And what does that mean, approach a value? That means that the values can be made arbitrarily close to it by looking closer and closer to the value a. Consider this illustration. The value of the limit for the function given in the graph is l equals 2. 2 is the limit of the function. And we can see that values of the function are approaching the value 2 as the variable get closer to the point x equals 1. In particular, we can decide, OK, so let's take a little distance this much from l equals 2. 
and we'll look at the graph and we'll see where a second uh, in this interval around the point x equals 1 if we look at the value of the function at any of those points they will be within the bound from l equals 2 but what you can do you can say well that was a not close enough and we would like to look closer say this far away from l equals 2. So we now kind of shrink that distance around l equals 2 and we see if the function value eventually closer than that distance. And look, indeed they are. You can zoom into this picture and you can realize, oh, wait a second, on this interval, values of the function will be within the bound. So Values of the function can be made arbitrarily close to value of the limit by considering point closer and closer and closer to the limiting point. Now let us read that notation. So limit as x approaching a, f of x equals l. How do we write that symbolically? The first is the limit. That symbol indicates that we are looking at the operation of the limit. So this x right pointing arrow a, that reads as x approaches a, and it indicates the point where the limit is taken. Now, f of x is the function in question. This is the function whose limit we are looking at, and L is the value of the limit. There is an alternative notation for the limit given here. So the first section where you have this f of x right point in air L, that reads as follows, f of x approaches L. Now, the second portion where you have this x right point in arrow A, that reads x approaches A. And if you read it together, you will have f of x approaches L as x approaches A. Let us emphasize again that in the definition of the limit, we do not consider the point x equals A itself. In the illustration on the left, the function is undefined at point x. And as a matter of fact, the function may be defined at point, might not be defined. We are not looking at x equals a when determining if the limit exists. We are looking what's happening near the point, not at the point. To reinforce that concept, let's look at the following example. We have three functions. And the first function is defined at x equals 1. The second function is undefined at x equals 1 as signified by the empty circle over here. The third function is defined at x equals 1, and the value of the function is equal to 5, which is signified by that solid circle over here. The limit as x approaches 1 of all three functions exists and is equal to negative 4. And what it really means is that we're going to look at negative 4 and we look, is the function getting closer to negative 4 when the variable is close to positive 1? And the answer is yes, it is. The function stays within the bounds around negative 4. Now we'll look at the second example. We put some bounds around negative 4 and we ask, is the function staying close to negative 4 when the variable is close to one. And the answer is yes, it does. The function clearly stays here within the bound. We go to our last example and we put the bounds and we ask, 
is the function staying within the bounds as the variable gets closer to x equals 1? And the, the answer is yes, it does. But then some people ask, what's happening here? Um, look, the value of the function is clearly outside of the bounds. But that's the value of the function exactly at 1. And in the definition of the limit, we do not have to look at the point 1 itself. So we only look near 1, not at 1. And near x equals 1, the function stays within the bound. The point x equals 1 itself does not matter for the definition of the limit. And this highlights the meaning of the limit. It complements value of the function. You have value of the function, which is value at the point. And then you may or may not have limit of function at that point. And it's not the same. When you determine value, we plug value in the function and we look at the result. When we determine limit, we look around the value of the variable and we try to see, is it getting close to a particular number? Thus, limit is a concept different from the value of the function. In fact, looking forward, when we discuss continuity, we will observe that for some functions, limit and the value will be the same. And these functions will be nice for the purpose of analysis and working with them. And for some functions, like that example number three, limit and value the function are not the same. Those functions we will call discontinuous and we will have to take special care when we work with them. Let us consider a couple of examples of functions where limit does not exist. On this slide, I have plots of two functions. For both functions, limit at x equals zero does not exist. Let's look at the left graph. We see that the curve of the graph is disconnected. And if we think about values of that function, values of that function close to point x equals zero, we will see that on one side of the zero, we will have values that are approaching zero values of the function gets closer and closer to zero. So we can think, oh, maybe zero is the limiting value. And we can think, okay, let's put a little bit of a distance from L equals zero, and we'll see if the function stays within that bound. And what do we observe? It doesn't. If we go to the left side of the neighborhood around zero, we will see that the function actually left the bound. So L equals zero is not the limit of F of X. Then you say, well, maybe, maybe M equals 0.5 is the limit. Maybe that value is a limit. But the same reasoning tells you that no, m equals 0.5, also not the limit. Uh, put a little bit of bound around it, you will see that function stays closed on the left from zero, but function does not stay closed to 0.5 on the right from zero. As a matter of fact, there is no number such that f of x stays close to when x approaches zero. In that case, we say limit of function f of x as x goes to zero does not exist. Now let's take a look at the right example. Here we have a function that takes on infinite values. Again, there are clearly no value L can be identified such that f of x stays close to 
when x is approaching zero. Now, what we notice is that the function takes an infinite value, so you can say, well, that value is infinity. But the matter of fact is infinity is not a number. That's a concept that has very specific properties. And we will discuss infinite limits a little bit later in this segment. It turns out you can generalize the concept of a limit to infinite values to some extent. Uh, however, because infinity is not really a number, it, it will not have the same functionality, say, as the limit that is a finite value. Also, the plot on the left that we considered just a second ago, while the limit does not exist, one can generalize the notion of a limit to special case when variable only approaches zero from the left or approaches zero from the right. The resulting concept is called one-sided limits and they are well defined for this example and we will talk about them shortly. Let us consider one additional example of the function that does not have a limit as x approaches zero. The function is sine of pi over x and to understand that function better, let me use Desmos to plot its graph, and we will discuss what's happening. So let me type in the function sine of pi over x. And we have a plot here on the left. Let me hide it. To highlight what's happening is that as x approaches zero, we'll have these oscillations going up and down and up and down. And if we try to zoom in, we will see that these oscillations get more and more frequent as we get closer and closer to zero. As a matter of fact, um, we can zoom in all we want. They will get more and more frequent as we get closer and closer to zero. At some point, the computer system will fail evaluating these values because there are some limitations of what we can compute. Uh, nevertheless, mathematically, um, we can imagine what's happening. Those oscillations will get more and more frequent and it will be compressed around zero. How many folds of the sign is compressed around zero. It turns out that's infinitely many folds. So let us try to understand how these folds are obtained. Consider pi divided by x. When x is approaching zero, let's say from positive side, which I will indicate by putting that little plus here, that means that x is approaching zero and x stays greater than zero it's approaching from the positive end then we have division of a pi by a small positive number the result is a large positive number So think about the graph of sine w. If this is w, and I think of sine w, it will be graph of a periodic function, and it will do its wiggles all the way to infinity. Now, instead of w, we'll start plugging pi over x. As x is approaching 0 from the positive side, pi over x will travel to infinity. It will go all the way over here. And as it goes, you'll pick up all of those wiggles and it will compress them into the portion of the graph that corresponds to x greater than zero. All of those infinite wiggles will be compressed and smashed in here. So in fact, you're looking at exactly an infinite amount of oscillations. Absolutely the same way, you can look at the case x less than zero. In that case, pi over x will go to negative infinity, 
and we will pick up all of those wiggles that signed us from zero to negative infinity and it will be smooshed into the left portion of the graph. So it's a very, very interesting function with very, very interesting properties. Now, but what do we try to understand here? We're trying to understand if this function has a limit as x approaches zero. And some people might say, well, let's evaluate a few values. So I'll start with x equals one. That would be sine of pi divided by one. Well, guess what? It's a sine of pi, and we know that's zero. Then you'll say, how about x equals one half? Then we'll say sine of pi divided by one half equals sine of two pi equals zero again. Very interesting. So let's say, let's start to get closer to zero. Let's say x equals one third. Okay, let's plug it. You'll have pi divided by one third equals sine of three pi. That's how the fraction will simplify. And then zero again. As a matter of fact, if you choose any value of x that's in the form one over n, then when you substitute it into the function, you will have pi divided by one over n that will simplify into n times pi, and the answer will always be zero. We can continue this process indefinitely, making x going, say, to zero plus in this case, because we're only looking at positive values that are approaching zero. Does this mean that limit as x goes to zero of sine of pi over x equals zero and the answer is no and this is how you can see it suppose we would like to test l equals zero to be limit of this function then we would start by putting a line l equals zero and then we would put a bound around say point two it will be sufficient. Point two up and point two down around zero. And the question is, does the function stay close to L equals zero as we approach X equals zero? And the answer is no. You can see that no matter how close we are to X equals zero, the function will leave the bound no matter how close x is to zero. As a matter of fact, for this particular example, there is no single value L such that the function f of x, which is equal to sine of pi over x, stays close to when x is approaching zero. Therefore, we conclude that limit of sine of pi over x as x goes to zero doesn't exist. Let us now consider a few examples in which Limit exists, and we will try to estimate it or guess the value of limit by looking at the table of values for the function or its graph, or both. This is probably not the best way to evaluate limit, definitely not the most rigorous. In the next section, we will consider approaches that do not require graphing, where we can evaluate the limit by algebraic manipulations rather than evaluating table of value. But for today's purposes, I will use the graphic software Desmos to make those compute. Let me start from coding the function in. So I will say f of t, I will need to use some value of the variable uh, here when I define the function. It will be equal to t minus one, divided by t squared minus one. Okay, here's my function. 
and uh, I would like to introduce a table of values. So in particular, um, instead of x1, so Desmos always gives you this x sub 1 and y sub 1 as a default, but you can change it into x and f of x in the second case. And what this will do, this will allow you to quickly build a table of values for that function. So we are interested to look at the limit as x approaching 1. So let us start with plugging some values around uh, 1. At 1.1, we get 0.476. At 0.9, we get 0.52. Let us get a little closer to 1. So let me say 1.01 .01 on one side. Uh, we get 0.49. And on this side, I will use 0.99. So I get 0 0.50. Okay, I started to see the trend. Looks like it's approaching 0.5. But let us just verify. 1.01, okay, 1.001 over here, and 0.999. So now I see that is really looking like the value 0.5. So just one last approximation so that I convince myself uh, completely. Um, indeed, it looks like the limiting value would be 0.5. Now something to remember, this is just an estimation of the limit value. To compute the limit value, we will use slightly different techniques that we will discuss in the next segment. But for now, we will make some approximations and then we will take an educated guess. And our educated guess is that value of this limit is equal to 0.5 and as a confirmation we will cut and paste that table over here let us look at our next example um, again we have a function that fraction was the square root of t plus one minus one in the numerator and t in the denominator. As before, we would like to see what is the limit of that function as t approaches uh, 0. So let me start by defining the function. Um, I will have a fraction, so I'll start with the square root of t plus 1. Okay, I used x, so let me make it x plus 1 and then minus 1 and we will divide it by t, not t but x all right and the same thing we're gonna try to build a table on the left column in the table we'll put value of the variable t on the right column of the table we'll put f of t since we are looking at limit as t approaches zero we can try different values um, around zero. So in particular, we can start with negative 0.1 and then we go to 0.1. So let me use values that are a little bit closer to zero. So 0 0.01, that's on the positive end, and negative 0 0.01 on the negative side. I get similar values, 0.49 and 0 0.50, very well. So let's get even closer to zero. Here's 1,000 and here's negative 1,000. I get 0.499 and 0 0.5001. So from here, we will conclude that the limit is most likely 0.5. And as a confirmation, we will use the table that we just computed. Now, if we need further confirmation, we can try to look at the graph of the function. As we see over here. And the purple dots are the points that we computed in the table. So 
as we zoom in onto um, x equals zero, we see that function is getting closer and closer to value 0.5. You can check that the function is undefined exactly at x equals zero, even though the graph doesn't show that it's undefined. But um, by zooming in closer and closer, we observe that the function is approaching value 0.5 if we are sufficiently close to zero. Let us consider one additional example. Limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x. For this particular limit, we will look at the graph of the function. Sine x divided by x has the following graph. We see it over here. Let me hide the expression and just focus on the graph. When we look at x approaching zero, we need to zoom on the portion of the graph that corresponds to the values of x that are close to zero. So here we have zoomed uh, the interval from negative one to positive one, and we see that function is um, approaching value of one. Uh, the graph does not show, but value of function at zero itself is undefined. You can check it by plugging it into the expression. However, according to the graph that we see, we conclude that value of that limit is equal to one. And to justify our answer, let me copy the portion of the graph that we evaluated. This graph will be the support for the answer. To conclude this section, let us consider an example that highlights the danger of just using computations. So here we have an example of a limit as x approaches zero of the following expression. We have x squared, that's one term, and then we have a fraction, cosine x divided by 10 thousand. So what I will do, I will implement that in the table in Desmos. We will start from writing the function. It would be t squared plus cosine t divided by 10,000. All right, and you can see the graph, and the graph shows that it kind of goes through zero, right? And uh, we can go ahead and build a table. So on the left column, we'll say x. On the right column, we'll say f of x. And we will try to evaluate a few numbers. So let's start with 0 0.1. OK, we get 0 0.01. You can put negative 0.1. All right, it looks uh, very good. It's actually a symmetric function around the uh, y-axis, so um, very nice. If we try 0 0.01, we obtain something like 2 times 10 to negative 4. So that, that would be 2 times 10 to negative 4 is 0 0.0002, and that is a number smaller than the previous one. So if we put 0 0.0001, we will have um, 1.1, 10, negative 4. So the numbers are getting smaller, and we are tempted to conclude that the limit is 0. However, it is not. As a matter of fact, there are two tendencies in this graph. So this expression will go to 0 as x goes to 0. It will get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, but this expression over here, will go to 1 as x goes to 0. And the fraction, the whole entire fraction, will go to 1 over 10,000. It's a small number, but it's not 0. So I will have two tendencies competing, x squared as the first term and the fraction as the second term. In the beginning, x squared will be more important. So for x 
greater than 0 0.001, that first term will probably take over. But once x will be less than 0 0.01, then the second term will be more powerful. So let's say make x uh, 10 to negative 4, then that second term will take over, and now we will have uh, 1.001 times 10 negative 4. So the number is no longer approaching 0, but in fact it is approaching 10 to negative 4 as it should. So let's take a few more zeros here, and you can see, but now we are approaching the value 1 times 10 negative 4, which is 1 over 10,000. So this example highlights the danger of relying on computations only. If we would be satisfied by the first four lines, we would say, well, clearly the answer is approaching zero. Uh, and that would be a mistake because there is a second part of the expression that is not very important for large values of variable t but it becomes more and more important for small values of variable t. And in fact, it determines the value of the limit. So in the next segment, when we talk about laws for operating with limits, we will discuss algebraic techniques that allows us to capture that situation systematically and to avoid making such mistake. But um, the last comment is that we can zoom in here on the graph and you see it takes a little while but eventually you start to see wait a second the limit is not equal to zero it is a finite number 10 negative 4. consider an application of concept of limit to life sciences we will look at a model for population size that accounts for a catastrophic collapse catastrophic collapse is an event where mass extinction happens in the population if the habitat is degraded beyond a critical level. In this case, their population size is usually modeled as a piecewise defined function. So here we have a function n of k, where k is a parameter that measures habitat quality. It is usually called carrying capacity. If the carrying capacity k is above certain critical level, the population is doing well, it reaches that carrying capacity and stays there. However, if the carrying capacity drops below the critical level, then extinction occurs and the population becomes zero. We will start by making a plot of the graph of the function n of k to see what it looks like, and then we will discuss it using the concept of limit. To plot the graph, let me use Desmos graphing software. To plot a piecewise defined function, we will have to plot several functions in Desmos, corresponding to each portion of the definition. The very first portion is y equals zero. That's the very first graph. And that graph should be applicable for values of the variable. I will use x for simplicity so that Desmos works with me a little bit better. Um, for variable values between 0 and 8. Now, Desmos asks if I should add a slider for you. Yes, I do. I want to use that. And I would like the slider start at 0 and end whenever. And once we have that portion defined, we actually see a little, little portion of the graph added to the picture. So uh, I will go ahead and change its color so we can see it better. So how about it's green? Now, the second portion of the plot will correspond to the case where the variable is above the critical level A. And in that case, we will have y equals x. and uh, applicable portion of the graph is when x is greater than or equal to 8. Okay, 
and we will change. So let's just make it official, that uh, curly brace over here. And uh, we will change the color of that graph into green so that we see that's the graph of the same function. Now we can add solid circles and uh, empty circles to, to make it pretty. It's not necessary for the sake of what we're doing, but let me show you how this can be done. So we can add a particular point to indicate that um, the second portion, when when we have k greater than or equal to a, um, the value a is achievable. We can add a solid point by just typing a sub a in this case. To change the color, we can go over here and make it green. And we can say we don't want to use the drag feature and we want that point to be solid. There you go. And to indicate that value of k is less, strictly less than a on the first portion of the graph, we will add another point. Also, okay, the x coordinate is a, but the y coordinate is zero. And we will do some um, editing here. So in particular, we don't use the drag feature to point. We want it to be empty circle. And the color we want green. And that put that nice empty circle over here. So we can zoom in onto the function. That's what the graph looks like. And let us borrow this graph and use it for answering the question in the problem. Now we have the graph of the function n of k given here in the lower left corner, and we will answer a few questions. So we see that as we approach the value of the parameter a on the left, the value of the function stays zero. Now, if we approach value of a on the right, then we have this portion of the graph, and well, the function is approaching A, which is over here. The question is, does the limit exist as K is approaching A of the function N of K? For that limit to exist, there has to be a value that the function approaches when the variable is close to value A. However, we see on one side, the function is approaching value A. On the other side, the function is keeping value zero. So we don't have a single value that N of K approaches as K approaches zero. As a result, we say that the limit does not exist. And we will write here D and E. The previous example motivates introduction of a generalization of the concept of the limit called the one-sided limits. In the regular limit, we are studying what's happening to the function when values of the variable are approaching a particular value A, and we are allowing the variable to approach that value a in any possible way. So here we go with this bottom picture. We may will start somewhere over here, then we go over here, then we go over here, then we go over here, and then we go bounce back and forth by inching closer and closer to the point x equals a. And we'll look what's happening. It turns out that it's in many cases simpler to focus on what's happening to the function when the variable is approaching point A only from one side, from left or from the right, like shown in this picture. So here, X is approaching A from the left. And what it means, it's getting closer to A, but it always stays on the left of A. 
x is always less than a. Now, on that other example, x is approaching a from the right. And what it means that x is getting closer to x equals a, but it always stays to the right from a, which means that x is always strictly larger than a. It turns out that those two cases are simpler to consider than the general case when x is allowed to approach a in any possible way. As a result, we are motivated to introduce a special case of the limit, the one-sided limits. We will say that f of x has limit L as x approaches a from the left, and in a similar fashion you can define limit as x approaches a from the right, if the function can be made arbitrarily close to L by taking x close to a while keeping x strictly less than a. So, as a matter of fact, the definition is almost identical to the definition of the regular limit. The only distinction is that values that we're looking at in the variable has to stay to the left of a. The fact that x is strictly less than a the fact that x is approaching a from the left is indicated in the symbol of limit. So x, right arrow a minus, that a minus reads that we are approaching value of a from the left. And you can think of that minus in the following sense. If we look at the real number line, and this is a, then taking it to the left will be like a subtracting a small number from a. So a minus would be a little less than a. So a minus was the minus appearing in the super index position means that x is approaching a from the left. Now, in a similar fashion, we can define what happens when x is approaching a from the right, and the corresponding symbol is x right arrow a super plus, and the way it reads is x approaches value a from the right, and the way the plus can be motivated is that we can look at the real number line and we can put value a and we can think of adding a small positive number here, a plus, a slight addition on top of a to make it bigger than a. So a plus is the area that's greater than a, a minus is designating the area that is less than a. So the corresponding symbolic notation can be seen over here. And both definitions of one-sided limits are almost identical copies of the definition of the limit in general, with the only restriction where the balance of the variable can be located, on the left of A or on the right of A. Let's look at some examples. Here we have a graph of a function f of x, and we need to estimate the values of the limit as x is approaching a from the left and value of limit as x approaches a from the right. According to the graph, so let me start with the values of x from the right. So limit as x approaching a from the right that would be approaching the value while staying greater than a. So that would correspond to the portion of the graph that is located to the right from a. And we can see that that limit 
is equal to negative 0.245. That looks like what this value is equal to, negative 0.25. On the other hand, if we look at the limit as x is approaching a from the left, so this is from the left, then we need to look at the portion of the graph that corresponding approaching value a but staying strictly less than a. In that case, we'd be looking at this portion of the graph and that value seems to come around 0.4 probably maybe 0.45 but i'll just okay how about 0.45 it's all approximate so let me write it over here that value i estimate to be 0.45 so Limit of function f of x as x is approaching a from the left is 0.45. Limit of function f as x is approaching a from the right is negative 0.25. Let us take a second look at the model with the catastrophic population collapse, the one that's given by the piecewise function n of k. The graph of n of k is copied here on the right. I used the same graph that we had a couple of slides above. And we answer two different questions. What is the limit of function n of k as k approaching a from the left? And what is the limit of the function n of k as k is approaching a from the right? These two questions can be answered by looking at the graph. In particular, limit of n of k as x as approaching a on the left, that would be, okay, that's the value of a, and on the left, that means that x is getting closer to a but stays less than a. If we're only looking at those values of the function, then that limit will be zero. That's what we will see. On the other hand, if we look at limit as x is approaching a from the right, for x approaching a from the right would be staying strictly on the right side of a. That means x is greater than a. And we only look at values of the function for x greater than a. If we look for those values, we will see that the function will change and uh, apparently that value will be approaching the value over here, which is A. Thus, for the model with population collapse, the one-sided limits allow to describe what's happening at the point where the collapse happens. There is an important relationship between one-sided limits and the general limit. Theorem 12 expresses that relationship, it turns out that limit of a function at a point exists even on the if both one-sided limits exist and are equal. So that can be expressed symbolically as follows. The limit exists even on the if both one-sided limits exist and they are equal. So how do we apply this theorem? This theorem can be used to tell us if the limit exists. And also that theorem can be useful to tell us when the limit does not exist. So let us describe when does the limit not exist. The limit does not exist when that second property is not satisfied. And there are different ways to break the second property. First, limits the one-sided limits exist but not equal or one of the one-sided limits does not exist or both of them doesn't exist in either of those cases the limit 
does not exist in Jim. So TM12 allows us to use one-sided limits to either prove or disprove the existence of general. Let us apply TM12 to the following problem. We'll look at the bird population problem. Um, we have a sample scenario where we have American robin and we record a population in a certain flock over the period of seven days. It's not very visible here, but this is day zero, this is day one, this is day two, this is day three, this is day four, five, six, and finally seven. So there are certain things happening to the flock. The birds lay eggs, then eggs hatch. That increases the population of birds. But it is known that only a quarter of the chicks will survive to the next year. So there will be also an extinction events for the chicks. So it could be a predator, it could be diseases. So a population will go down when that happens. So let us assume that we have an ornithologist recording the population of that particular flock. So at certain day zero, they observe 45 species. Then at day two, they come and count that there is 26. And day three, they see there's uh, 28. So what could possibly happen? Well, we assume that a couple of uh, chicks hatched on, on day two and on day three, two, okay, on day two, one chick hatched and day three, additional two chicks hatched. Now, something happened between day four and five. There is an extinction. We lost several birds. We lost exactly five birds, and we assume it's because of the predator. So the population of the flock went down to 23. So the graph below describes these developments. So one-sided limits could be used to discuss this graph and to describe it. Using the graph, we will answer the following question. What is the limit of the flock population as a function of time as t approaches 2 from the left? Minus is from the left. When we look at limit from the left, we need to make sure our variable t is strictly less than the value 2. And if we only focus on values that are strictly less than 2, that value that we observe will be 25. Okay, let me change color. So now let us ask the next question. What is the limit for the population when t approaches 2 from the right? 2 plus stands for from the right. Okay, so we will focus on the value of t equals 2, but we have to think about t being strictly greater than 2, and we only look at the portion of the graph that is to the right from 2. If we only zoom on that graph, we will see that the value of limit is 0.6. Now, the question is, what about limit as t goes to 2 for the population? and from theorem uh, by theorem 12, we know that limit of p of t as t goes 2 from the right is not equal to the limit as t goes 2 from the left of p of t. From the right we have 26, from the left we have 25. That's not the same. Therefore, limit as t goes to 2 of p of t does not exist. That's using the theorem. Of course, you can establish it directly, but the theorem is much more easier to um, use. It just says, look at the left limit, look at the limit from the right. Are they the same? No, because they're not the same. Limit does not exist. Very well. So now let us take a look at the Last question, limit of the population at t equals 6. Well, at t equals 6, we are looking at just a constant function, and it's not changing, and you can approach from the left, you can approach from the right, it's going to be the same value, 
value of 23. So that limit exists and is equal to 20. In conclusion, we will consider the special case where a function is taking on a very large positive or very large negative values near a point. We will say that a function has limit positive infinity as x approaches a, and we will write the following. If values of the function can be made arbitrarily large, large positive, by taking x sufficiently close to a. This concept is illustrated on the top plot on the right. Here we have the case where a limit of function f of x when x goes to a, in this case looks like a is equal to 2, that limit is positive infinity. And how do we know? Well, we decide, um, we pick a large number, let's say over here, and we see that there is a small region around point A when the variable is within that region, the function will be above that level. And we can make that level higher, and all it takes is to get closer to A to surpass that other level. So if this is the case, we're saying that limit of F is positive infinity. Absolutely the same way we can define limit that is negative infinity, and we will write that limit as x approaching a of f of x is equal to negative infinity if the values can be made arbitrary large negative by taking points close to the point a. One-sided limits can also be defined in the same way as we define them above for the regular limit. So what we're going to do next, we're going to work out a few examples to see how do we work with infinite limit. So let us look at the example of limit as x is approaching 3 of 1 over x minus 3 squared. We can definitely make a graph, but we would like to introduce the conceptual thinking where we don't use uh, computational tools. We only use them if they absolutely need it we try to understand it on the level of trends. And what is it we see here? We see here that as x is approaching 3, x minus 3 is a small number. x minus 3 is a small number. It can be positive if x is greater than 3. It will be negative that x is less than 3. But what is important that x minus 3 squared is a small positive. And the sign is very important because when we divide by a small positive number, when we take 1 and divide by a small positive number, we get large positive. Sign is very, very important for the infinite limits. Because if you have positive, you'll get positive infinity. If you have negative, you'll have negative infinity. And if you have alternation of signs, you might not have yet limit at all. So in this case, we have division by a lot or small positive numbers. The result is large positive numbers. So therefore, we conclude that the limit is plus infinity. Let's try it again. Find the infinite limit as x is approaching 2 from the left. So here we go. x is approaching 2 from the left of a fraction, 1 over x squared minus 4. So let's try to think. Um, as x is approaching 2 from the left, that would be, here's the number line, so well, I would put 2 somewhere here, right? And we would be approaching that 2 from the left. Now, what can we say about x squared minus 4? Well, we can say it gets smaller. That's good, but what is its sign? Well, the sign is not immediately clear. On one side, when x is greater than 2, we expect it to be positive. When x is less than 2, we expect it to be negative. But um, let 
us pause here and work out the situation with sign uh, in more detail. So there are many ways to do it, and uh, let me show you the slow and sure way to do it, and then maybe I'll show you a quicker way to do it. So a slow and steady way to do it is to factor the expression. If the expression can be factored, we can break x squared minus 4 as x minus 2 times x plus 2. And we can do something that's called sign analysis. So we will put two rows. One corresponds to x minus 2 and one corresponds to x plus 2. It doesn't matter where you put those rows vertically. That's not important. The important is the horizontal alignment with real number line. And on the real number line, there's two important numbers here, negative two and positive two. You will see why the negative two is positive two is important. The positive two important because this is where x minus two becomes zero. x minus two is zero at x equals two. Now, if we go to the left from two, then x will be less than two will be subtracting 2 from a smaller number. So I know sine of x minus 2 is negative on the left from 2. Absolutely the same way, if I go to the right from 2, I will be subtracting 2 from a larger number. So the answer will be positive there. So I'll put plus, plus, plus. So what we did, we quickly identified the sign of the term x minus 2. It is negative. On the left from 2, it is positive on the right from 2, it is 0 at 2. We do the same for the second term, x plus 2. x plus 2 is equal to 0 when x is negative 2, hence negative 2 was important here. And if we go to the left from negative 2, we would be having a number that is less than negative 2, and it will overpower the plus 2, so the overall result is negative. Now, if we go to the right, we're going to be essentially taking a negative number that is smaller by magnitude than 2 and adding it to 2. Overall result will be positive. So we can do it this way. And we investigated the sign of the second term over here, x plus 2. Now, what we need, however, is the sign of the product, x squared minus 4. But the sign of the product can be computed from the sign of the component. In particular, when uh, x minus 2 is negative and x plus 2 is negative, x squared minus 4 will be positive. Negative plus negative gives us positive. Now, when one of them is negative and the other is positive, the product is negative, and one of them is positive and the other is positive, the product is positive. So we know the sign of the expression by combining the signs of the multipliers. So going back to my uh, example, now that we did the sign, we understand that as x is approaching 2 from the left, which is over here. The sine of x squared minus 4 is negative. And 1 divided by x squared minus 4 is large negative. Therefore, We conclude that limit as x goes to 2 minus of 1 over x squared minus 4 equals negative infinity. So this is probably my preferred way of solving it by breaking the expression into pieces and investigating each piece separate. It is highlighting two fundamental ideas in science. Uh, take a complex expression, break into simpler pieces, study each simpler piece, combine the results to discuss the complex thing. 
it also helps you to uh, keep the answers correct. It also helps you to avoid errors. But let me show you a couple of shortcuts. There's a couple of shortcuts. And I will give them in the order of preference, from more preference to less preference. A possible shortcut is to notice that x squared is greater than 4 if x is greater than 2, we just notice that x squared is greater than 4 and x squared is less than 4 if x is less than 2. And then you can conclude that x squared minus 4 is less than 0 when x is less than 2 because um, the square is an increasing function, so once you go backwards, like at exactly 2, x squared equals 4, but before 2, it will be less than 4. Okay? As soon as you notice that, you can jump to the same conclusion. The limit is negative infinity. So that would replace that all big sign analysis. It is totally acceptable solution as long as you can do it right. Now, what you will generally get from a web page or video that you will Google a suggestion to evaluate for a number that is near x equals 2 and on the left from it say x equals 1.9 right and if you do that you will see that you'll have 1.9 squared minus 4 equals negative 0.39 and it's clearly less than zero so here we go we will conclude that um, x squared minus 4 is negative and the answer is negative infinity now this would give you a correct solution however that's the most dangerous this solution often leads to errors so a couple of sources of error first of all you plug in wrong if you plug in wrong you get the wrong answer you get the entire problem wrong and you will not be given partial credit because you didn't really show uh, your reasoning and there's not much to grade off. So another source of error is when you plug a value that's too far from two. Uh, we are so attracted to integers and sometimes going to the next integer, let's say one, will give you answer that is way off and you, you, you will use an incorrect conclusion. So while this is probably everybody's favorite approach judging on what i see on the test just plug a number that is also a most dangerous approach because you have to be very very careful to do your computations right and choosing the point in the right way so there's two danger zones choose point wise error and compute carefully. Now, if you're good on both cases, chose the right point, did the right computations, you will get the correct answer. However, um, I would prefer that you go with either approach one or two rather than three, because uh, approach one and two also allows you to practice analysis looking at the expression, playing with them, understanding their trends and inner workings. And that to me is a very valuable side progress. I don't know if I convinced you, but I gave you these three possible ways to um, get the answer of um, negative infinity in this problem. Let's see which one will be your favorite. So let us consider a couple of more examples. So here we have an example of a function natural law. So we have y equals natural log of x 
the graph of that function is given here on the plot and according to the plot as the variable x approaches zero from the right then natural log takes on large negative values so the answer here is negative infinity there is a connection between infinite limits and the concept called vertical asymptote. In particular, every time there is an infinite limit, either one-sided limit or a limit from both sides, we are looking at the case of a vertical asymptote. The definition 18 captures that idea. So x equals a is a vertical asymptote of a graph if either of the following holds. And if you look carefully, it's all possible infinite limits that can happen at a point. So if one of the six possible infinite limits happen, we are looking at having a vertical asymptote x equals a. Let us put this notion to action in this example. So we are asked to find vertical asymptotes of the function one over x squared minus nine. To find vertical asymptotes, we need to find points where we can potentially have in infinite limits. Well, so far, the infinite limits we observed when we have division by zero. So let's see when this function can have division by zero. So x squared minus nine is a denominator. And if we set it equal to zero, we can have two possible solutions. x squared minus nine can be factored as x minus three and x plus three. And it is zero if x equals three or x equals negative three. Both of these points are candidates for infinite limits, and both of these points are candidates for vertical asymptotes. So let us do the analysis. So in particular, let us uh, make the sign analysis. Uh, let me put the points negative 3 over here, positive 3 over here, and let me uh, factor out the x squared minus 9 as x minus 3, x plus 3. So let me do the sign analysis. It doesn't matter where I put those rows vertically. It is important where I put them horizontally. Horizontally, I align um, the sign to the x-axis. So in particular, let's take an x minus 3. x minus 3 is 0 at 3. And when we go to the left from 3, we subtract from a lesser number, so we'll have a minus. When we go to the right, we subtract from a larger number, we'll have a plus. Now let's go to the second one, x plus 3. Now x plus 3 is equal to 0 at negative 3. And when we add a number that is larger by magnitude by negative, we will have a minus. And when we add a number that is getting larger and larger, then we'll have a plus. So these are the signs for these two multipliers. And from the two multipliers, I can conclude the sign for the entire uh, expression. For x squared minus 9, we have the following sign. So for x strictly less than negative 3, minus and minus combines into plus, so I have plus, then 0. Uh, between negative 3 and positive 3, minus and plus give me minus as a product. And then at 3 I have 0, and after 3, plus and plus give plus as a product, so I have positive again. Now, if we think about uh, the infinite limits, so there will be the several limits that have come to mind. So when we think about a 1 over x squared minus 9, we expect that the sign stays the same. It will be positive. But at negative 3, we'll have division by 0. So we'll write it as infinity. 
then the sign will be negative, then another infinity, then the sign will be positive. That consideration allows me to sketch a graph, maybe not very accurately, but at least to capture the key behavior. To the left from negative 3, I expect that the function goes to plus infinity. To the right from negative 3, I expect that the function goes to negative infinity. And again, to negative infinity at 3. And after 3, I expect my function to go to positive infinity. Which leads me to the following infinite limits. Limits as x approaching minus 3 from the left of f of x gives me plus infinity. Limit as x is approaching minus 3 from the right of f of x is minus infinity. Then limit as x is approaching positive 3 from the left of f of x is minus infinity. And finally, limit as x is approaching 3 from the right is positive infinity. The infinite limit suggests that we have the following vertical asymptote. And we have a vertical asymptote x equals negative 3 because it corresponds to at least one infinite limit. And another vertical asymptote at x equals 3 because it also corresponds to at least one vertical limit. Let us consider one additional example, and in this example we highlight that the sign analysis is something that we do as needed. If we can get away with a simpler thinking, we will get away with a simpler thinking. Okay, so we need to find horizontal and vertical asymptotes of the following function. And we know that vertical asymptotes happen when we have infinite limit, and infinite limit happens when we... Um, have division by zero, so we'll be looking for division by zero here. And then for horizontal asymptotes, we need to consider the behavior as x goes to infinity. So in this problem, we'll combine the topic that we just introduced and the topic that we considered in the previous segment. So let us start with the vertical asymptote. Vertical asymptotes happen when we have infinite limit, and infinite limit in this case can only be obtained by division by zero. We notice that the denominator, which is x plus 1 squared, is equal to zero when x is negative 1. So we start to think what will happen when x goes to negative 1 of the fraction of 1 over x plus 1 squared. And here I'm doing a little bit cheating. I already noticed that x plus 1 is always positive, so I can get away with simple argument without going into the detailed sign analysis. I notice that as x is approaching negative 1, x plus 1 squared becomes a small positive number. And the positive is because of the square. Because any number squared is positive, so no matter whether x plus 1 is positive or negative, x plus 1 squared is always positive. Thus, 1 over x plus 1 squared is a large positive number. Therefore, we conclude that limit is positive infinity. So here we go, plus infinity. And we have a vertical asymptote, x equals negative 1. Now, to find horizontal asymptote, we can remember We need to consider limits as x goes to plus infinity of f of x and limit as x goes to minus infinity of f of x. So let's take a look. 
So I'll look at limit as x goes to positive infinity, 1 over x plus 1 squared. Well, I have division 1 of a large number. And that is 0. Absolutely the same way. When x goes to negative infinity, I have 1 over x plus 1 squared. Overall, it would be 1 over a large positive number. Because of the square, the sign will not matter. And overall, that limit is equal to 0. So we happen to have both limits. A limit as x goes to plus infinity and limit as x goes to negative infinity. In general, each limit would give you an asymptote. But limits are the same, so we get the same horizontal asymptote for both x going to plus infinity and x going to minus infinity. So we have a horizontal asymptote. y equals 0.